Currently, more than 250 million tonnes of meat are consumed every year, and the figure is rising as the world's population continues to grow to 9 billion people by the middle of this century. Each year, people eat more than 50 billion chickens, while over a billion pigs and hundreds of millions more cows and sheep are also raised for their meat. Another six billion hens lay on average an egg a day for us to eat. And 250 million cows produce over 600 billion litres of milk a year for us to consume. These animals are often kept intensively in cages, crates or crowded sheds to mass produce cheap meat, eggs and milk, which many consumers demand. Yet at the same time, we are discovering that farm animals are far more sensitive, intelligent, and emotional than we realise. the screen, you're almost there. With meat and dairy production expected to double in the first half of this century, is there a better way to feed the world without putting animals into factories? All animals were wild and free to roam before we started farming them. These are wild boar, the ancestors of modern pigs, whose natural habitat is woodland. Pigs today behave in the same way. This family of the Tamworth breed enjoy browsing in the undergrowth, grazing and rooting in the soil. They happily spend hours each day foraging for food and investigating. When allowed to live naturally, sows would often produce one litter of piglets a year and their young would stay close to their mother for months. But this is not enough for intensive pig production, where sows are made to produce more than two litters a year. In many parts of the world, the sows spend much of their lives in cages. During pregnancy, they're kept in sow stalls. Both the UK and Sweden have banned these cages, but they still import pig meat from other EU countries where this confinement is permitted for the first month of pregnancy. In the rest of the world, sows can spend their entire adult lives confined. Pregnant sows are kept on a strict diet, in these cramped conditions, they are hungry, bored and frustrated. This sow is repetitively biting the bars. Bar biting is a result of frustration when sows cannot carry out natural behaviours, including foraging for food. A few days before giving birth, the sow is transferred to a farrowing crate. These crates are designed to prevent the sow rolling on top of her young, but they frustrate her natural maternal instinct to build a nest. In the wild, or free-range systems, she'd use straw, grass or twigs. Desperate to nest build, but without any material, she goes through the motions in mid-air. After giving birth, she suckles her young for up to a month. The piglets are free to move, but unable to turn around, the mother can't interact with them when she wants to. Four weeks later, whilst the piglets are still suckling, the mother is removed so she can become pregnant again. Confused as to where their mother has gone, the piglets try to find her. When the sow next wants to suckle her piglets, she becomes distressed and calls out to them, and this can go on for 24 hours. At only four weeks old, the piglets still want to suckle. The sudden change of diet can cause digestive upsets and many need to be treated with antibiotics. More than half the antibiotics administered on British farms are used in the pig industry. Kept in barren environments, they get bored and start to investigate each other. This can lead to tail biting. The risk of tail biting in intensive systems is so high that piglets' tails are cut off shortly after birth. 
EU law forbids routine tail docking and requires the provision of materials like straw to keep them occupied. Yet this is unenforced and in many pig producing countries 99% of tails are docked and many pigs are never given straw. Crammed together, they are fattened up until they are about five months old. They are then sent for slaughter. These piglets still have their tails. They are kept in an environment with plenty of straw. As long as new material is frequently added, the piglets are kept interested, so the risk of tail biting is much reduced. Another alternative is to keep pigs in free-range systems. Organic pigs, like these, stay with their mother for longer before weaning. This means they are better adapted to a solid diet and are less likely to get sick or acquire antibiotics. This French farm doesn't keep pregnant pigs in sow stalls. In systems like this, when they want to forage, they can root around in the straw. When they give birth, they are moved to a pen which still gives them some freedom. There are many alternatives to the farrowing crate, which reduce crushing and piglet mortality through good husbandry and by selectively breeding sows to be good mothers. Many commercial pig farmers prefer to keep their sows outdoors and as a result, in the UK, around 40% of piglets are born outside. Chickens are descended from the red jungle fowl of Asia. As their name suggests, this is a forest bird. They perch high at night to be safe from predators and the trees provide them with cover to protect them during the day. They scratch around in the soil to find food for themselves and for their chicks and dust bathe to keep themselves clean. Modern day chickens retain the behaviour patterns of their ancestors. Two types of chicken have been bred from the jungle fowl, egg laying hens and broilers for meat. In many parts of the world, egg laying hens are kept in barren battery cages. Young hens arrive on a lorry from the farm where they were reared. They will spend the next year in a cage, after which they will be sent for slaughter. Conditions are cramped. Each hen will get less space than an A4 piece of paper. Following campaigns by Compassion in World Farming, the EU banned the barren cage in 2012, sparing over 200 million hens at any one time from this severe confinement. However, most EU hens are still confined in enriched or colony cages. These give the hens some very limited freedom of movement and provide perches and areas for scratching and nesting. However, a cage is still a cage. Conditions are still crowded. They are very cramped vertically and they can't perform natural behaviours such as dust bathing or perching high. Meanwhile, some consumers are choosing to buy eggs from cage-free systems, where hens can express more natural behaviour. Though barn hens remain indoors, free-range and organic hens are allowed outside. Both barn and free-range hens can exercise, stretch their wings and lay their eggs in nests. They can also dust bathe and scratch for food. Tree cover encourages them to range, since they feel more secure from predators when they have somewhere to hide. Hens are naturally birds of woodland clearings. This chick has been bred for meat. After a very short life of less than six weeks, he will sell in a supermarket for only a few pounds. He has been born into a mass production process. The chicks are sorted along conveyors, counted into groups, 
sprayed with vaccines and stacked into trays ready for transportation to the broiler sheds. To begin, our chick may have plenty of space, but as he grows, the conditions become more crowded and he has been selectively bred to grow fast. The chicken on the left is a normal sized egg layer. The chicken on the right has been selectively bred for meat. He grows much faster, putting on a lot of extra white breast meat muscle. Faster growth means he can be slaughtered earlier, consuming less feed in his short life and quickly making way for another batch. But putting on weight this fast has its consequences. Our chicken's body may get too big for his legs, which can then collapse under the strain. Thousands of chickens are painfully crippled by the time they reach their slaughter weight. Good farm workers will aim to put these birds out of their misery, but with huge flocks to look after, this can be difficult. In summer, it becomes hotter and hotter as the crowding increases, and the air can become polluted with ammonia from their droppings. Some may have trouble obtaining food or water. Growing so fast puts a strain on their hearts and lungs, and not all survive. Even those who can get around become easily tired. Getting up and down can be an effort, and some find it difficult to do this at all. Should chickens live like this? Following campaigns for chickens run by animal welfare groups and well-known TV personalities, consumers are increasingly choosing to buy chickens from higher welfare systems. This system provides natural light and gives the birds more space. Straw bales are provided for perching and to encourage exercise. This British system, run to standards set by the RSPCA, uses slower growing birds. These walk better and are more active and have more energy for getting up or down. Free range systems also allow birds freedom to move outside. Here, birds stream out in the morning into fields where tree cover mimics their natural forest habitat. Perhaps one of the best systems is the French La Belle Rouge. These slow-growing birds remain healthy and active, roaming freely through the pasture provided. We are used to seeing dairy cows in fields, grazing on their natural diet of herbs and grasses, as well as on leaves from trees and hedges. But in Britain and other European countries, Many cows are kept inside in barren conditions and are selectively bred to produce twice as much milk as they did 40 years ago, resulting in a range of health and welfare problems. Ten years ago, the vast majority of Danish cows had access to pasture during the summer. Today, the large majority are kept indoors all year. And even in a country like Britain, which thanks to the rain grows plenty of grass, 10% or more of cows may spend their entire adult lives inside. And there is a growing number of American style mega dairies, like this one, where over a thousand cows are kept indoors all year in huge zero grazing units. The trend indoors is being driven by intensive farming, where cows are fed a diet high in grain and soya to increase their milk yield. This means they don't get to graze outside so often. High yielding cows are prone to problems of lameness, which can affect as many as 40% in some herds. Lameness is also more of a problem in cows kept inside. Drained and exhausted by excessive milk production, cows often become infertile. Cows who can't become pregnant again will be sent to slaughter. Bad traditional practices are also a problem for cows. These German cows are tethered. Tying cows up is traditional in many European countries. Some farmers give their tethered cows daily exercise and put them out to pasture in the summer, but these Bavarian cows are tied up all day, every day. 
but is there a better way? This British organic farm keeps less intensive breeds of cow who tend to live longer, so it costs less to keep the herd going. The grass grows well, so it is a cheap food which produces milk profitably. Organic rules state that herbivores, such as cows, must have access to pasture for grazing whenever conditions allow. But to produce milk in the first place, the cow needs to give birth to a calf. This calf has just been born. He has just taken his first few breaths. He is very vulnerable. The mother starts by licking him clean. The bond between them is already growing. Her new arrival attracts interest from other new mothers. Shortly, she would feed him for the first time. But we keep dairy cows to produce milk for us and not for their offspring. So her calf is now separated from his mother. Naturally, the mother doesn't want to lose sight of the calf. She will go through this painful process every time she gives birth. Her calf is taken to a pen. Since only female cattle produce milk, he will be reared for meat. Some other male dairy calves have a different fate. Some are shot at birth. Others are sent on long journeys. Every year, thousands of calves are transported to countries such as the Netherlands for veal production. Some come from Germany, but others from as far away as Ireland to the west or Poland to the east. Dutch veal calves are reared intensively on slatted floors without bedding. Most veal calves are slaughtered at the age of four or five months. But there are alternative ways of keeping calves. Some countries, such as Britain and Sweden, have passed laws which require calves to be given bedding. The British beef and dairy industry have worked together to reduce the number of calves exported or shot at birth by rearing more of them for beef or veal in these higher welfare systems. This Scottish dairy farm has gone one stage further, exploring the possibilities of keeping calves with their mothers. The idea is that the farm will produce less milk, but the calves will grow better and produce good beef. Come summer, they will be out on grass. And do these cows like to be able to eat their natural diet of grass? They certainly enjoy being let out for the first time in spring. We have seen that animals can suffer pain and distress. Given the right conditions, they can also enjoy their share of life's pleasures and animal behaviour scientists have been discovering more about their emotional lives and intelligence. Rather like us, farm animals have strong emotional drives based on instinct. Perhaps the strongest is the maternal drive. This ewe has just sensed that her lamb is missing. She calls to her. Another sheep responds to her concern. This younger you may be a companion or perhaps a daughter from a previous year. As an experiment, the lamb has been hidden behind bales of straw. The mother searches the next field, calls out again, smells for evidence of scent and listens. The hidden lamb calls back. Her mother recognises her call at once. Though the lamb is only a few days old, the bond between them is already very strong. Soon after, the lamb is released and the two are reunited. Other farm animals, like chickens, are also driven by strong maternal feelings. This hen, recently released from a barren battery cage, is on a mission. 
She is about to lay an egg and has to get through this maze to reach her nest. This is an instinctive emotional need, but to succeed she must use her intelligence. She has to work out that the computer won't open the door until she pecks three times. Her strong maternal instincts drive her on until she finds a safe place to build a nest. To us, she may be just a food animal, but she still has powerful feelings inherited from her wild ancestors, which are often thwarted in intensive systems. Other farm animals, like pigs, are also surprisingly intelligent. This is Hamlet. He has amazed animal psychologists by learning a computer game which was originally designed for chimpanzees. Hamlet has to move the cursor into the blue area around the screen. When he does, he gets a sweet. The scientists make it progressively harder for Hamlet, yet he learns to succeed every time. Oh, good boy. That was good. Can other animals do this? This is Lex, a Jack Russell dog. Lex is willing, but even after a year of trying, he hasn't quite got it and needs help. Pigs can be as intelligent as dogs, yet we treat them very differently. Watch the screen, you're almost there. Should we only treat animals according to our needs for food and companionship? Or should we be more concerned about the animal's intelligence, emotional needs and capacity for both happiness and suffering? The pressure to intensify meat production means more and more pigs, chickens and cattle around the world are being incarcerated in intensive farming systems. But this could be a mistake, as meat production is inherently inefficient. For example, when a pig is fed grain, only about a third of the energy he consumes is turned into pork or bacon, and half of that energy is in the fat, which is often discarded. The rest is either used in respiration, to generate energy for exercise and for keeping warm, or it is wasted, ending up in the pig's faeces. This inefficiency means that it takes more than three kilograms of grain to produce one kilogram of pig meat. In a world where a billion people go to bed hungry, does it make sense to feed farm animals with grains and other crops that could be eaten directly by people? An alternative way to produce meat and dairy products might be to keep cattle and sheep free range on pasture since these animals can eat grass, which people cannot eat. Everyone can make a difference to the lives of farm animals, and it comes down to personal values. You choose what you eat. If you eat meat, milk and eggs, like most British people, then on average, in your lifetime, you may consume more than a 1,000 chickens, 25 turkeys, 20 sheep, 25 pigs, 4 beef cattle, the life's work of 50 laying hens and half the produce of a dairy cow. To that you can add thousands of fish. The lives of these creatures will depend on the choices you make. As a consumer, you can buy the cheapest meat and eggs. You could choose to reduce the amount of meat you eat or to go vegetarian or vegan. You could also choose to buy higher welfare products, including organic and free range. Look out for labels such as RSPCA's Freedom Food Scheme or Soil Association Organic. For an extra few pence per day, you could buy free range or organic eggs where the chickens get to range outside during the day. For an extra two pounds or so, this chick could enjoy a longer life with better health and the chance to roam freely. You can also help pigs if you look out for freedom food, free range or organic. The mother can live free of cages and the piglets grow up in a rich environment with straw or soil to investigate. 
If you look out for pasture-based dairy products, such as organic, the cows will be allowed outside in spring. As a citizen, you may also decide to get involved in campaigns about the future of farming. It is entirely your choice, but whatever you choose is likely to make more difference to the animal happiness or animal suffering in the world than any other choice you ever make. Thank you.